I remember hearing what they call a danger or doubt distress signal. Five blasts from the air horn, basically signaling that you are in harm's way. I've got three people in the water. When stuff goes wrong, it can go wrong very quickly. You can see a real sense of panic, and they just kind of clung to the watercraft. I see how close the cruise ship actually is to us. I had to get them out of the water. Oh, my god. There's only so much room you could turn. Stopping is not an option. I had 130 feet to work with. You thread the needle. I knew I was in a bad situation. I never paid attention to the shadow. You know, the urgency all came from how close that ship was. Get in! The hero is a person who puts him or herself at risk for the benefit of others. They are the kind of people who stand in harm's way and do not wither in the heat of battle. It has been my great blessing to have spent most of my life in the company of heroes. I grew up here in Brevard County, a little uh, unincorporated town on the far north end of the county. Small population, a town called Scottsmore. I grew up hunting and fishing, and my father's always had boats. Learned how to operate a boat pretty early on. I am assigned to the Agricultural Marine Unit. Out at Port Canaveral, we have a marine security side that we do all the waterside security for the port, and then we assist Coast Guard and Customs. Our primary duties out here are waterside security and outbound and inbound escorts to the cruise ships. How many days a week are you out here on the water? Every day that we are working, we're scheduled out here, we are on the water directly behind where these cranes are. Uh -huh. Our Canaveral precinct, our port precinct is stationed over there. Coast Guard Station Canaveral is right over, I don't know if you can see the cutters over yep. there, is right over there. She's one of the older ones. Oh, yeah, she's old. This cutter's probably older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> where do the pilot boats come in? The pilot boat office is gonna be on the south side of the port, about midway down, close to where the big silos are. Yep. And they leave from there. They'll go out to sea and they'll pick up the ship outside of the buoy line, usually before it comes in the buoy line. The pilot's job is to basically provide local knowledge of the port, whereas a captain who may very, very well know his ship may not necessarily know that port. So the pilot will actually be transported out by another boat. Then the captain essentially turns over the reins, and the pilot now is control of that ship. The complexities here are you have large ships in a confined area. When I was a captain on a ship, we didn't like to get within one mile of another ship when you're passing each other out there in the ocean. In port, I have to take that one mile and I have to shrink that down to 50 feet. You're dealing with big ships, confined waterways, there's other ships around to make it a, a challenging job to take a 1,200 foot ship up a 400 foot channel. This ship right here has around 3,800, 4,000 passengers, give or take, plus another 1,500 crew. And when he's the pilot on this ship, he is responsible for everything on that ship. The thing that makes the small boat traffic challenging is you don't know what they're going to do. It's a big ship. It's a small channel. The sheriff's department with their escorts, they're an important and integral part of getting a ship safely in and out of the port. They're like the sheepdogs. They keep all the small pleasure boat traffic out of the way. It was a typical day out here at Port Canaveral for me. We were doing an outbound escort. It was one of several that day. There were two jet skis. I remember seeing them leaving the boat ramp and go across the channel to the north, and then they were out of my sight. I'm about halfway down the ship on the south side of the ship as we're outbound. They weren't really in the middle of the channel, but they were off on the channel edge. So I called the sheriff's boat and I asked him to just to go over and make sure that they're aware. Sometimes it's not obvious that a thousand foot shit's coming down on you. As I'm en route to them, 
is when I saw the one sitting the farthest back had fallen off in the water. As they try to pull her back up, the watercraft flips over and all three of them end up in the water. So now there's two jet skis upside down in the water. The wind was such that it was blowing them right down into my direct path. I remember hearing what they call a danger or doubt distress signal. It's five blasts from the air horn. That lets other people in the area know that I think there's a dangerous situation evolving. It also lets Deputy Primary know that, OK, the situation has gone from bad to worse. There was a second watercraft that had been riding with them. And right as I was pulling up, they pulled around and picked up the, the first girl that was in the water. As they picked her up, I'm hollering at them to leave, you know, just get them and get out of there. What's going through your mind at that point? I've got to get them out of the water. I knew that if I could get them in my boat, even if the cruise ship hit my boat, chances are, unless it's an absolute direct hit, the likelihood of us being injured by that would be far less than those two just being in the water. Tanner, how badly could those girls have been hurt with a ship like that coming in on top of them? My biggest concern for them was to be sucked under by the cruise ship as it passed by. These large ships, as they come through, they cause a suction underneath them. If they were right in front of the ship, they would get pushed off to the side a little bit just because of the bow wave. As the water rushes down the side of the ship, it creates a suction force, and you would actually get drawn in, and they would roll down the side of the ship. As you get in closer towards the stern, these are 20-foot propellers. Even if they had a life jacket on, they could get pulled underwater. Then you could have bodily injury. Could you tell how close that ship was getting to you as you're doing this? At the time when I got up to him, I knew I had a little bit of time. However, the wind was pushing us into the channel. He's closing that gap, and it was going to be interesting very quickly. That cruise ship's not going to be able to stop. Everything is going through your mind. My prime concern was to safely clear the girls. But in doing that, not put the ship into a hazardous situation where I could endanger the passengers in the ship itself. Now, I was limited by the channel edge and the dredge on my starboard side. There's only so much room you could turn. You know, stopping's not an option. I had 130 feet to work with. You thread the needle. You've got seconds to get them out of the water. When I tried to pull the first girl out, I wanted to stay as close to the helm, as close to the controls as I could. However, with just the design of that boat between the cabin and the gunnel, there's a handrail, and there just wasn't enough room for me to get a hold of her and get her in the boat. So that's why I had to drag her back to the back. When I was pulling her in the boat is when I looked up and saw how close I was to that cruise ship at that point. Oh, my god. That's when I really was concerned that there was a possibility of a direct hit. Get in. Get in. The other girl was still hanging on to the jet ski. She hadn't moved. She was kind of frozen. So I pulled her to the back, too, and, and threw her in the boat. Oh, my god. The bow of that ship was coming by us, but that ship flares out. From however wide it is right there at that bow, it grows greatly. My concern was getting me and them as far away from that boat as I could. So reverse was the only place I had to go. Did we run over the jet ski? Without the pilot's training and actions, and without the ability for me to be there and be in that position, surely there could have been a loss of life somewhere. We are so lucky he was here, because if not, we wouldn't be here. He's my hero. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. Reviewing everything, there wasn't a whole lot different that we could have done. He did what he needed to do quickly, which is a mark of good training and good judgment. Couldn't ask for any more. Your lovely wife, Heather, is at this point blissfully unaware of any of this having happened. Right. So 1900, you get home, and you tell her what? Just another day at the office. It was just another day. The next day, I was in the store with my son shopping. He sends me a video of what happened. And I just started crying because I didn't realize how close it had been and what he actually did that day before. Do you pray? I do, every day. I used to be in the armor business. Mm -hmm. right? Stuff like he's wearing. And I had a wife come in one day with the vest that her husband had been wearing. And thankfully, it stopped all five bullets. We trade him out. Here's a brand new one. He says that every night, when he's got night duty, I lay awake waiting for him. I lay awake waiting for him to get home. And I can't sleep until I hear the bell crow. You know what I mean? Bless you. I'm a deputy that tries to come to work and do my job every day. 
I had two lives to save, and it was my responsibility. I was there at that time to save two lives, and if I didn't save them, I was willing to die trying. A hero, by definition, is a person who puts him or herself at risk for the benefit of others. Tanner Primer chose a profession that increases his odds of being in harm's way every single day. Tanner Primer is an American hero, and his story deserves to be told.